Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the CloudReach DevOps live stream. Um, I'm going to be the uh, the host for this uh, fantastic session with some great people from across CloudReach. Um, we're going to be talking about DevOps, um, a concept that is not new to many people, but something that is um, is growing and growing in popularity as more organizations adopt cloud at, at huge scale. Uh, it also coincides with the launch of a, a new offering that CloudReach has um, launched last week called DevOps as a Service, um, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end. But um, first, we're going to just introduce some of our um, attendees. Uh, maybe start with you, Christian. Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks, James. Yeah, so my name is Christian Nielsen. I'm the Global Head of Profession for the Advisory Service Line. What that essentially means is um, we help enterprises um, and companies of all sizes, really, with the change management of adopting cloud. So processes, security posture, adapting the business drivers to the cloud and the technology initiatives that you got going on and, and all the, the jazz that comes with that. That's what we specialize in. Nice, thank you. Tammy? So I'm Tammy Hauer. I'm a manager of data and analytics for CloudReach. I uh, manage all of our data team globally, uh, data architects and data engineers, and we assist people with moving to the cloud and getting their data in a more usable state. We got Brad over there rocking the cloud reach, whatever that is behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Massive sticker. Massive. Um, hey everyone, Brad Campbell, Chief Technologist of the Platform Development Service Line here at CloudReach, um, counterpart to James actually. Um, I like to think of the Chief Technologist as a uh, person who wears many hats. Um, so kind of looking at the way we take things to market and even some elements of advisory and sales and technical adoption within the organization. So uh, many hats, some very fun to wear. And um, I'm going to hand it over to James. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. My name is James Dunn. I look after our platform development business in garbage. Um, so we help customers um, build enterprise cloud platforms that come with all of the security and the governments, governance and automation that you can expect. And also we help customers adopt cloud in the right way using the right engineering architectures and principles. Um, so I think probably a good, a good starting point um, is, you know, what, what does DevOps mean to us? I'm sure, I mean, as I mentioned, DevOps has been around for a long, long time now. Um, my personal experience comes from being the Phoenix project a long, long time ago. Um, and, you know, I think everyone's got their own little personal story of how, what it means to them uh, and how it might have helped the customers that you've been working on. Maybe we can dig into some of that as a, as a starting point. Um, Brad, over to you. Any, anything that you, you can uh, remember? Uh, yeah, lots of, lots of stories, some good, some bad. Um, yeah, I'd come back to kind of that classic definition of the intersection between development and operations. And, you know, it's kind of been the the starting point for the idea of DevOps since, you know, the, the whole thing kind of coalesced into the industry. And um, I still like that definition, um, but it does leave a lot of room for interpretation kind of based on where the organization is at or the individual group that you're working with. So I'm sure that's something we'll probably dive into very deeply as we continue this conversation. So I will leave it there. How about you, Tammy and Christian? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think to me, the root of DevOps is really, um, so So my history is I was a, a Unix engineer and we were always automate all the things and the kind of progressed naturally into DevOps, right? And I think DevOps is more about um, the, uh, you know, the communication between teams instead of being siloed, helping the integration between, I always considered myself a liaison I'm kind of a liaison between all the teams because I can speak your language of software development, but I can also speak ops language of infrastructure and things like that. And so you kind of bring it together so that you can have a more uh, agile and fail fast type type of uh, operation. Mm. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I, I've heard similar things. I mean, some people say you shouldn't even have a DevOps team, right? It's 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 just a, a function. It's mm. like a, a practice within your organization of being able to collaborate properly regardless of your role um yeah that's that's really interesting how about you christian yeah I, I think tammy hit on something super important and and especially for me given what i do with enterprises they they often approach us and they're like we want to become more devops or we want to learn how to do devops what they're really saying is they want to be more agile and i think we're going to be discussing that a bit more today right that 
the term DevOps and, and Agile sometimes is used interchangeably, uh, but they're not the same thing. Um, they are two, two, um, two birds of a feather, which is not even an expression in English, but you know what I mean. Um, so uh, for me, it was my first experience with DevOps was before I actually knew much about the term. I just had the pleasure of working with some extremely smart developers and we were so resource constrained that we didn't really have, we couldn't afford operations people. So whatever we built, we kind of had to make sure it stayed alive. Mm. Um, and we got to a point where the guys just started developing less and less because they really didn't want to do the heavy burden of, of running it and the responsibilities of that. Mm. So we started looking at tools and models and automation to sort of make the, the task of operations or whatever we built easier and, and more resilient. Uh, and it turns out that we were not the only ones, like all around the world, development team were sort of moving this direction, right? So it was just on fire, all these weird collaborative tools that started coming out. And uh, this was in the beginning of containerizations or the wider adoption of it. So we, we started just grabbing different tools and trying them out, basically just try to make our our day-to-day -day work easier and bring back the fun again. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so for us, we did, we developed, we discovered that dev DevOps from the other direction, from the point of need. Yeah. Yeah, and then you kind of come on to well, what is it? How does it help organizations? I think we've all touched on like little little like snippets here, like removing the silos between development and operations, collaborating uh, across the business. I think they're kind of core themes of, of DevOps, right? Um, but right. what does it actually offer? I mean, personally, I think organizations, particularly now in the current climate, every single one of them is either trying to save money or be agile at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think DevOps, DevOps creates, helps you accelerate value through that software delivery life cycle, you know, uh, and right. those principles of collaboration, continuous improvement, like feedback iteration loops and all those kind of things, you kind of get to a point where the output of that is a more streamlined business. In, from my perspective, anyone, mm. anyone agree? Any, any comments? Well, let me. I, I think one thing that, like, one elephant in in the room of, of DevOps, right, is oh, the no, the notion of uh, you build it, you you run it, and yeah. and to me that that has been what, that's one of the biggest problems right now for me because it makes a lot of people scared of DevOps, and DevOps does not immediately mean it does not equal you build it, you run it. DevOps is really a way to be smarter about how to run stuff and to bring the barriers down between the people that are responsible for operations and day-to-day -day and the developers that are hit with more and more feature requests, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about being smarter about that. So when we are helping enterprises with DevOps, one of the things that they have heard and that they worry about, uh, especially their, their developers, is that they would end up having to do operations. And that's not what they signed up for. So I'm not saying that it's impossible. I just think that someone said that at a stage a long time ago and it was catchy and it just started like ringing true. Um, but DevOps is not you build it, you run it. It means running things uh, with higher feature cadence and, and without necessarily sacrificing the, the, the availability and resilience. And also there are some patterns within DevOps that I think is super important to discuss today, uh, which, which is great and such as embracing failure. It's a normal state yeah. of software and it's a normal state of businesses. And I think businesses started, like IT was there to support the business a long time ago and the business uh, values a long time ago was like, you can trust us, we don't change. You can trust us, we're resilient. Um, but then, so IT sort of started supporting that. But over time, business, the way you do business has changed. Today, it's about different values that, that holds true to customers. And with that, the supporting function of IT also needs to change and that's what devops embraces that's what it is well it's continuous change isn't it it's, it's you know, right. organizations have to are constantly changing so your yeah. this is your your tech your culture mm -hmm. has to be like completely wrapped around that right um right i've got a question well, brad and tammy actually from a from an engineering perspective i think one of the things that i love hearing about outcomes of Dev devops is it's, it, it kind of promotes a climate of, of learning and to some degree, some kind of like psychological safety because people, you know, the fail fast mentality of, you know, DevOps and, you know, not being scared to fail and learning from those failures, I think is a really 
nice mantra for every engineer to have and it almost it's almost anti what it was like you know 10 20 mm. years ago like failure you means you, you lose your job right <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, back whenever I was a Unix engineer, we had one day a year where we did major updates and took every system down. And so that was a big problem if something went down, right? And now the idea is completely, that was in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. And then now the idea is do it fast, fail fast, back, you know, build it in such a way that you can back it out quickly and try again or whatever. But I wanted to mention, too, on the people worried about doing ops, I think um, that was kind of the opposite of uh, what I what I, our goal was whenever I was, you know, back, you know, back whenever it was kind of more in the beginning of DevOps. But, um, you know, the idea is to make everything self-service so you could literally go and just click uh, what you want and go do it like you don't have to know anything about what's behind the curtain and the cloud is even better right now because you don't have to know anything about what's behind the curtain. You just pick what you want and go do it. And um, I, I think that that's, that was a huge thing for, yeah. for uh, the DevOps team, which is why I think you do need a team, right? Cause you need to bridge that, you know, the ops people want to build the servers, but the dev people don't want to bother the ops people. And so you kind of build that, that bridge where, they can they can do that without doing op kind of work, I think, too. That would be cool. Yeah, I like kind of thinking about, you know, we saw this happen, you know, like early 2000s is, you know, kind of the emergence of the whole DevOps thing. But it's what's more interesting to me is to look at some of the things that actually underpin the capabilities that, you know, have become these ideas that kind of surround DevOps, um, you know, it, it, it seems like really radical, but you know, the idea at the time was like, let's, let's release changes in smaller batches. And what Tammy said made me yeah. think about this. Cause I actually worked at a product company where a release actually took 12 to 24 hours to execute. And like, you know, you could get into the 13th hour and be 99% done. The whole thing flops over and you roll the whole yeah. thing back. And you know, like mm -hmm. at that point you've done database schema changes and like all these nightmare kind of sort of scenarios that we talk about, but you know, there was just like this idea that like, Oh, well, let's just, you know, let's just release features in, in their smaller units of, of functionality. And, you know, this magical light bulb went off, but, you know, like that seemed, that seems so obvious, but really there were a lot of things that were happening kind of upstream of that, that, that actually led to that happening. Right. So, you know, back in the day, like, you know, Git, not everybody was using Git. Um, like not everybody was using distributed version control systems. People still had like legacy version control systems with like single object checkouts where, you know, only one person could even be working on a file at a time. It could, and so, you know, it's like, it seems so obvious, but there are a lot of technology changes kind of happening, like, you know, late nineties, early two thousands that actually led to this even being possible. Yeah. Um, so I think it's kind of funny that, you know, it, like business has really latched on to the, the business value, but, you know, it's also fun to kind of talk about what was happening uh, from kind of a technology practitioner point of view around that time that actually even led to some of these, you know, aha moments even happening. It's like, oh, you know, now we got branches, right? We can merge these branches. Like, you know, the idea of just having small features kind of roll into a main line and even wrapping some sort of automation around that, like that just wasn't yeah. really possible before. Um, so it, it's kind of fun to think about and talk about those things and, you know, talking about 24 hour release windows and, you know, somebody uh, going through like six pots of coffee in a day and you know, right. like, hoping that the phone doesn't ring because their feature like broke the whole release. Um, and I was that guy at least once. So, you know, kind of relate the pain there. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of fun to reflect on that. And I don't think we we do that a lot. So it's good to talk about it. Yeah, but, wait, I, I want I want go, Christian. Sorry, I was, I was just gonna say, I wonder to what degree that the the improvements in performance also is behind the advent of, of DevOps, right? Because with, with computers as a service being just so much more powerful, it allows for more abstraction layers and decoupling. And, and I think the, the fact that we can create software defined networks, that we can start programmatically in, in create environments and, and virtualize environments, that in itself has really freed us up to allow for automation, to allow for, for developers to get closer to operations. Because back in the days, like if you were a Perl hacker, you were a Unix guru, and then you automatically kind of gravitated towards operations. Today, I, I struggle to see you be able to operate anything without knowing a decent amount of, of coding, because that's, how, that's what operations today is. So it's only natural that DevOps is part of 
how you how you function as a company today or as an IT team. And that also means that you need to start collaborating more depending on which whatever role of speciality you have. The the idea that you just because you develop something, um, you shouldn't I think you need to be you need to be curious about how this will run and what makes it run. And in doing that, it shouldn't equate you being responsible for the running of it. But it means that you want to talk to the guy who will or the girl who will operate it and even exchange some of the tool chains because that that's where you find a lot of power. Yeah, I think it's about having a shared goal from the value that that product is delivering to a customer or user through to how that product's been designed and, and it is built through to how it's being run on a platform and having a shared goal across all of those teams to me is what is what DevOps is, you know, because you, you roll up everyone under that same co common value chain that you deliver out to something, you know, uh, and I think that, that to me that's that's fundamentally what DevOps is. Um, if you put all the technology, right. technology for, for weeks and, and, and months but it really is about having that shared goal. But I'm sure I'm sure there's a bunch of DevOps engineers that are really good at it, looking at or listening to this right now, and they just blew a gasket when you said that because they couldn't they couldn't disagree more, right? I, I think it gets muddy because the business objectives is such a part of it's such a substantial part of how development of software is done today, hmm. and that is in itself not DevOps. DevOps, if you if you want to be strict about it. DevOps is is uh, it's not even a framework, right? It's a it's a concept of bridging operations to development and, and automation and metric measure everything and learn and, and respond to that, which is deviantly close to being agile, right? But the agile that is the business communicating with the developers and DevOps is really developers communicating with the operations of something. Hmm. Um, but when enterprises look at DevOps, they are sort of talking about the, the full Monty. How do we take business? to operations and, and merge that together, which means you, you're opening up for the conversation to be about how do we become more agile and innovate and, and open up for innovation when it's still fresh, as all the way down to how do we ensure that we can still continue as a business, that we don't disrupt ourselves too much by all these feature changes that we want to introduce. Well, and I think that's where like the value chain, like your mentality, that buy-in is so important because even when we like to say you have to fail fast, but we have to have an environment. And that's one of the hardest things to do whenever you're implementing DevOps new into an organization is getting people to agree that that is what we're gonna do. We're gonna fail fast. Yeah. Like sometimes you're gonna fail, but uh, yeah. do it fast, roll it back. You have to have that same, all that value going through all of the groups. Otherwise, yeah, it doesn't. It's yeah, hard. that's that's a really key one, right? And I think- That's what, a really good, yeah. One of my, the next question I'm going to ask you guys is kind of what does good look like um, in an organization? I think you're touching on it there, Tammy, because you've got to have the leadership team fully understanding and expecting um, these things, right? So these teams are expected to be cross-functional, collaborate, mm -hmm. fail fast. Um, they work on iterations. So it's like a, it's not a project project based approach to development. It's a product based approach because things constantly yeah. change, right? And and trying to get your leadership team to buy into that is, is the first hurdle. I mean, I'm sure all of you guys have been involved in a project where we've been engaged with customers. And unfortunately, you know, our teams are working in that way, but the customer's trying to catch up. And I think that is a barrier, isn't it, to, to, to getting it right? It's, it's so hard. Every, everybody wants to be changed, but no one wants to change. I mean, it's 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 um, the, the nature of the game, and it's really really hard because yeah, you you want to reap the benefits, but the price is pretty high because it's a cultural change that needs to happen, yeah. and and a painful one at that. And I think most business leaders want to be thought of as innovative, mm -hmm. agile, you know, but then you introduce what that what does that look like? Well, it means that you need to embrace completely different set of KPIs. Quality cannot only be about like your, your operational integrity. It needs to be about like feature cadence. And that is a KPI. When you accept that, then you're also accepting a bunch of these things that we're talking about. Fail often, error budgets. And uh, yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow during the transition of your culture. Cool. Anything to add on that, Brad and Tommy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, most often, at least where I've really seen people kind of go in on this idea and they've kind of come from a, a more traditional operational 
um, paradigm where you know operations is operations and development is development. It, it's it's the operations folks that tend to feel a lot of the pain. Um, mm. Software developers are, are writing software, and it ironically, like I, I don't know, I see a lot of people do DevOps, but it's not really DevOps. It's just you know we've shifted our operations engineers from pushing stuff into a data center to pushing stuff into the cloud. Um, so, you know, whereas they were writing bash scripts and things before, like now we expect them to just like, I don't know, use Ansible Terraform or whatever. Like it's kind of retooling and it's not really a true adoption of this notion that, you know, we really want cross-functional teams. We really want, you know, intersection. We really want lowered barriers. We really want shared responsibility at the end of the day. And, you know, uh, that can come out in lots of different ways. You know, you can incentivize developers towards, you know, service availability and uptime and things like that. So, you know, they may not strictly be responsible for the uptime of a service and that, you know, they're the first ones that get paid when a service goes down. But um, are you writing your code in such a way that it's robust? And, you know, if something should go down, like if I lose a node in an auto scaling group, like, you know, your software can also accommodate those sorts of failures. And, you know, just because you push stuff into the cloud doesn't mean like, you know, bad software is bad software. You can run it anywhere. It's still like if it's crappy it's uh you're not going to get you know good outcomes right so i think there's there's a lot of retooling i think a lot of times the ops teams feel more of the pain but you know if you're thinking about this the right way everybody should feel some of that pain that christian was alluding to um everybody should you know kind of look at you know what are the best ways to do things? What, what what's available to us from a technology perspective that we can you know grab hold onto and, and uh, kind of advance the state of our business and our products and th that sort of thing. So I, I think it's you know it, yeah, right, but that's a call to arms for the for the uh, for measuring right. I mean, if you look into DevOps or talk to DevOps people that are really good at it, they they constantly keep coming back to the fact that you got to measure everything. You're going to have metrics and you need to respond to them. And I think that is exactly why. It is not just a fancy word. It, being able to monitor and measure how your estate is feeling and what's happening there, and also the, the quality of your code, how resilient is it, how cost effective is it? It's only when you can see these data points that you can actually respond to them. Like yeah. you, you might be, you might be a, a, and I think most developers are, they're really doing the best they can. But if you're in the dark and you don't exactly know what happens once you throw it into production, then how are you supposed to learn from that and improve, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, and that's again, one more reason you wanna bring these teams together, but you also wanna make sure that you equip the team with the right tools to know what's happening, to understand what's happening. Otherwise they can't respond to it. So what does it, what's like a tangible example, like, like a, a technical deliverable or a type of platform that's kind of been influenced by DevOps? I mean, I see it as like, the ultimate maturity of an IT organization is when they've got self-service within their their platforms, you know? Because to me, that shows you that that organization knows how to deliver technology as a service. So not just taking some components and, you know, hey, here's a virtual machine, but actually, you know, automating the entire end-to-end -end delivery of IT to mm -hmm. the business. But also, I guess, teams like, working across each other like the idea of like security teams being embedded within here as well and we haven't even talked about that or finance teams for example you know involved in engineering i think i think that's to me that's what good looks like is an it organization that can be like you know you can press a button and you can get access to it as a service as a consumer or a user you know does anyone else have any yeah. examples of what good looks like well, what you just just described is I mean, that's not good. That is great, but mm -hmm. what is behind the scenes there is if you have guardrails that prevents pr abuse, you want guardrails that that you that you as a developer would never cease or doesn't feel. That to me is a great estate. When your security posture is not being compromised or ad ad affected in any sense, when you know that your costs are not going to run out of control, and when you have a culture that embraces trying things out that's when you can capture innovation in the early on and 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 then really nurture it when it's fresh and they can try things out and they don't feel constrained by the environment or by lead times or by bureaucracy uh, and they can explore and the guardrails are just there in the background and instead of preventing things they're sort of supporting things they're supporting the right behaviors that to me is is great and that is the very definition of, of in, a good implementation of devops in your organization Yep. And I think it goes to the very, you know, outcomes that it promises. Right. And that's, you know, agility, speed, quicker time to market. Right. Um, 
and that's nice because you know what you get in that sort of platform is all of your operational and all of your risk and governance is rolled into that already and that's things that you know somebody might mess up if they don't know about them but you've codified that in the platform already so if somebody can consume it then they can consume all those controls they can you know consume all those risk tolerances that the business has defined and you know that's baked into the platform you don't have to worry about it anymore um so what yeah. does that let you do that lets you not waste your time worried about all you know my pci compliant and my you know Am I, am I going outside of, you know, IT policy 001.023, you know, that says that, you know, every KMS key must be, you know, owned by the application BU that's writing the software. Like all that stuff is built into it and I don't have to worry about it. And I can just go write my software and produce value for the organization. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, like Christian said, like that that's kind of this Zen state, you know, where yeah. – you don't have to worry about all these internal things because like even with, with cloud, you know, you still have things that come with that, that, you know, are overhead for product development teams that they have to think about. So, you know, the next abstraction of the, on top of that is things that are organization specific that account for that, that, you know, is another consumption platform. Well, and that's all part of the, you know, kind of your pipeline. So all of those, those um, policies and everything, everything should run through that. Everything should be forced to have a, a, you know, secondary set of eyes before it ever goes anywhere. And those are things that I think if you um, are not clear on the process, you think are slowing it down because, you know, yes, you have to have peer reviewed. Yes, you have to have run it in dev. Yes, you have had, had to run it in test, you know, all of these things. But that's also what helps you. Yes, you fail fast, but hopefully you don't fail all that often in production. You fail right. in, the, in the prior steps, you know. And so all of yeah, I mean, you, you want to limit the cost of failure, uh, something that the Google talks about in their SRE book, right? And the, the cost of failure needs to be brought down so that you actually don't, they're not that afraid of failure. Uh, and you asked James, like, where's a good place to start? I think not trying to get it right from the beginning is a good place to start. Uh, I've seen a lot of failed attempts at getting DevOps because they sort of use the old tools and, and the old mindset of trying to implement it. And it's like, all right, we need to get all these whim lanes correct and the process needs to be perfect and we need to use all these principles and we need to do pair programming and we need to do, and it's eventually like, they're not gonna get anywhere um, because they're, they're not ready to just dip the feet in the water and kind of like roll with the punches. It's, if you really, if you wanna embrace it, DevOps, you also need to um, in, embrace being a bit agile and fail a lot in the beginning but that's part of it that's that's how you make it yours you know i think we mentioned sre devops and agile in the same sentence <laughs> bingo <laughs> yeah you win um which brings me nicely onto the next uh, question i have for this team what comes after devops um i mean devops has been around for a while things are moving along people have tried it they probably they're probably really enjoying it. They probably want to know what's coming next. What 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 do we think is uh, the kind of next thing on the horizon? Well, I think you can DevOpsify everything, really. I mean, you can directly DevOpsify actual ops, you know, too. Um, we focus on dev and software development, but I definitely think there's a big area in ops. I mean, and even in non-technical groups, you can go across the business. I mean, there's like a biz ops now. That's yeah. you know, your, your business DevOps type thing. So yeah. You can do that way. I mean, also, one thing that should be in there, but is often uh, considered a next step, is working on your technical debt. It frees you up to be able to work on that too. So. Yeah. 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 I think, um, you know, if you look at Agile, you know, that was once uh, exclusively for like application engineering and, and a way to develop software. And now, I mean, we do it, we speak to large enterprise and we're, we're coaching executive leadership teams on how to be agile, right? Yeah, I think yeah, with, exactly. With DevOps, you're starting to see that go out of the business to your point, Tammy. It's kind of going into finance now. I and mean, we've been doing FinOps for a while. We also know our customers are building out their own FinOps capabilities and they're embedded within DevOps teams. There's a lot of ops, ops, ops. <laughs> uh, DevSecOps, you know, that's the that that's that's been on a huge astronomical rise over the past couple of years. You know, mid shifting security closer to the developer. You know, and so I think I, I mean for me, I think the next change is is going outside of tech. You know, because I think tech gets it now relatively. 
And I think going out into the business is when you really start to see that cross-functional working, you know? I think that's that's a cool way of looking at it. And it, it kind of goes with the, the, the term, uh, everyone everyone seems to have a slightly different take on what DevOps mean, but that's, uh, and, and it's often heralded as like a weakness of, of the term. I, I think it's the opposite, right? The strength of DevOps is that it isn't necessarily a framework. It's not very prescriptive. It's a set of, of best practices and ambitions and goals, which means that it doesn't necessarily need to, the, the, the trend of DevOps doesn't really come to an end because nothing, something new comes. I think DevOps as a concept will morph. Uh, mm -hmm. and start bringing in and encapsulate more things over time. And and that's the power of it. I mean, I think, oh, sorry, go on, Brad. So, I mean, you know, just looking at this through the, the technology lens, I think the, the the next iteration of DevOps is no ops. Um, and I think you can kind of see that on the horizon, you know, especially in some of the, the announcements coming out from some of the providers where AI is kind of increasingly finding its way into the platforms itself or platform platforms themselves um, and you see the adoption of more serverless types you know highly abstracted uh, services that give you the ability to deliver your application architectures I mean eventually um, and behind the scenes right this is all kind of an SRE mindset happening at the cloud providers themselves but um, I think eventually what you're going to see in a lot of organizations is you know we don't really even need ops because ops is you know built into the platform, ops is given to us through some monitoring tool that, you know, has enough AI capabilities that, you know, it actually learns what we do to remediate failures and it can take over those functions for us. Um, so thinking I about- think, I, think, I think the principles will still be there, won't they, yeah, right? Prin just, yeah, absolutely. Some of the groups will be doing less, less work, hopefully. <laughs> right, yeah, still function, still, you know, prime, more more focus on business value, less, fo yeah. less worrying about, you know, oh, this function, Failed. Why did it fail? But I I also find that we often we often need to to um, educate to some degree or explain the DevOps is if you really want to benefit some get some of the benefits of, of what DevOps mean it's a cultural shift that needs to happen it's how you function and how you operate how you communicate uh, and which values you hold dear to you and establish principles that everyone understands and actually thinks are, are realistic. That, that, that is how you implement DevOps. A misunderstanding that I've come across too often for it to be funny anymore is we want to be DevOps. Can you help us install Jenkins? It's like, see, we, that's not like, I can give you 10 Jenkins boxes. You're not going to be any more DevOpsy because of that. You're just going to have more servers that you don't understand how to manage. Um, DevOps, the tools that typically are attributed to DevOps are there to support a methodology. They're there to support a, a, a practice and, and, a, and a way of functioning together, cross-functional teams, error budgets, etc. So that's where what it comes down to. The tools come second. First, you need to look at how you function, how you communicate, and, and who you have in your team. I completely agree. And, and Tammy, I've got a question for you before we go on to the next question. Maybe you can try and answer it um, quickly. <laughs> but um, how, how is DevOps used within the data, um, the kind of the data elements that you work in? You know, like is, is it embraced within data operations and the way in which you you deliver tech that way? Like, how how is that? Is it is it all one and the same? How is it? How do you work with DevOps within the area that you work in? Well, so we, we work with the DevOps, I mean, with the systems infrastructure type people, you know, implementing the pipeline just, just like you would normally, I think. I think we would just be another aspect within the same pipeline. I mean, of course, it's not a piece of code. Well, maybe it is, but uh, it would be a different um, what you're implementing, but it's the same mentality, I think, no matter what group, just like you can go to other business groups and really have the same mentality, it wouldn't matter um, that you're in a different, uh, you know, uh, specialty or whatever. So I think it would be about the same. Um, I don't know how many, um, I, I haven't looked it up, how often are we have actually gotten to implement a DevOps type data uh, project here. I think it's, I think it's, um, a lot of what Brad was saying about feeling like it's a like it's a DevOps, but more it's just um, uh, using the old mindset in a new way. And yeah. 
I really think that needs to change. And getting that buy-in is what I think is hard. And I think having DevOps as a service from us, while we have teams implementing the other thing, I think that could really work together well to kind of change that mindset, really. Thank you very much. Right, let's go on to our final question before we get on to quest, uh, questions from the World Wide Web. Um, what role can partners play in DevOps adoption? Um, when we live and breathe it as a team, um, so you know, how are we best posed uh, to help employees, I should say, to help customers? I mean, I think we can be the role model for um, for how to do it right. Uh, we we should have the people that that can um, train people be you know train the teams and help help get that implemented correctly i mean i know that we don't want to get you know stuck in the perfection as the enemy of progress but i think when you have the right people that actually know um how to do how to do it have done it before i think that helps too mm -hmm. yeah I, I we live and breathe the train the trainer kind of mindset and i think when it comes to these things, because they are not what we said before, they're not which tool do you install. They are a cultural shift and a mindset shift. And the, the, the best way to get that across is learning by doing. So try stuff out and then having role models that you can be very close to, meaning someone that can show you uh, the, the practically how they work and how they structure themselves, how to communicate, etc. I think these are really important. And that's why you want to Oftentimes, if you want to change a company, you need to change from within. But the best way to do it is to benchmark with something that comes from outside. So bringing one or two change agents into your team is like, that's how you can hyper, uh, that yeah. works like a hyper catalyst to actually changing your company. Uh, yeah. And DevOps is, is all about changing from within and bottom up. Yeah, and when you say change in agent, I don't think you're talking about change managers. You're talking about just engineers, right? Who've just got that who who know how to do it. Because exactly. yeah, I I think everyone has a role to play. If if you're a partner like CloudReach and you're an engineer and or you're a consultant or you're an architect and you're going into a customer project and you're claiming to do DevOps or or embrace DevOps, then I think everyone has a responsibility to to be a change agent, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think what what makes uh, a lot of us unique uh, and, and the value that we bring, I think, is that w we've all worked in companies that were not DevOps, that weren't agile, that were very traditional. And we've taken active steps towards um, changing that ourselves. So we have had the role of change agents in the past. We've seen both the before and the after states. So we know all the pain points that are in the way and we know which, which ones are normal, natural and, and good. And which pain points are the ones you kind of want to uh, preemptively avoid? Uh, and, and that is also valuable because you have to recognize that change is sometimes painful and it comes with some friction. So identifying which friction is momentum in the right direction and which friction is there because we're really doing the wrong thing here. Third parties, externals, people that have been in the, in the trenches before are the best ones that can help you identify the difference between the two. Brad, you, you've done a lot of projects in your time. Come on. Um, uh, really, to me, it does kind of go back to that, you know, to 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 lead in a way where it's actually a really hard thing to do, you know, when you think about it, even kind of stating it. I mean, because you don't want to come in and tell people that they're doing things the wrong way. Um, sometimes what you want to do is show them that they're doing things the wrong way. Uh, it's a lot less abrasive that way. Um, I think when you can show people that, you know, we can live within the context of your, your risk governance or, you know, your, your things that you've set up through ITIL processes through 30 years that are really designed to just mitigate risk. Um, we can automate those processes. We can, you know, introduce automation to still leverage your uh, change approval board or, you know, your ITIL based ticketing system. Like, you know, sometimes people's heads kind of just like blow uh, when you kind of introduce them to those concepts. And you know, it's one that that's definitely achieved through experience, right? It's not like, you know, um, you, you're not going to just drop somebody in and say, oh, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll be happy to integrate with HPSM for you. Like, you know, some of those tools require a lot of not like domain knowledge and experience expertise um but yeah i mean i think it, it's just down to one experience um which you know is a lot of the time having done the wrong thing and learned what the right thing to do was and you know there, there's no other way to get that through 
yeah. other than experience. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, kind of having a very well crafted approach to delivering those learnings to folks um, when you're brought in, because there's always kind of a some level of suspicion or um, trust when you're a third party and you're brought in to, you know, do something that may be perceived as a failed effort um, on the part of a team to, to drive some sort of change or adoption. So you're kind of always, you know, starting from a little bit of a, a, a disadvantage in terms of perception, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I think we got a cat on there. Yeah, we do have a cat. Um, bring a cat with you. People love cats. Yeah, that's that, the way uh, to makes them more amenable it. too. So, um, unless they're a dog lover, and then you get a different problem. So, I have one of those too. So, okay. <laughs> when we when we were looking at because when we built this DevOps as a service offering in High Reach, we were looking at some of the what what can we change as a business to be a better partner to enable DevOps within customers, and I think. My experience before CloudReach, and Christian, I think you alluded to it, like the problem of, I, I always see it as a problem of partners selling professional services, then selling managed services, and then the customer is responsible for integrating those two things. Because, I mean, you guys know this, if you've been in any of these kind of old school like tech delivery companies where the delivery team will just hand it over to ops, two separate entities, two separate silos, and really, you know, the customer it's the customer's problem at that point you know so i think what a modern partner needs to be thinking about now is is moving that slider within their own organization embracing all of the principles and, and elements that we've talked about and be able to offer that to a customer you know because at the end of the day you've got to be that role model um so which uh, that, that and one of the other things we looked at was the fact that customers when you're talking about DevOps work, and we, I think Brad, you might have mentioned it about this um, continuous release, right? You're continuously developing and iterating. And so you've got to have a commercial model or contractual model with your partner kind of reflects on that, you know? And we've got, we've seen customers who want to be agile, they want to embrace DevOps, but they, they still expect, uh, a, you know, a statement of work or a project that starts at A and finishes at B. And we all know in the cloud world that it's continuous, right? You're always going to have to be working like that. And I think that's another thing that partners have to have, be able to offer their customers in that area. You know? Agile contracting models. Agile contracting models, you know. Let's put another use of agile. <laughs> Flexible, contracting Flexible contracting models. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more about, you know, having partners that, you know, can live more in the entirety of your value chain. I think that's kind of what you pointed to there with, you know, professional services and managed services. Like let, let's stop even calling them those two things and just understand that, you know, let's just have a team that's responsible, maybe individual functions or one or two of those, or, you know, one or the other, but as, as what we give you, like we, we care more about the whole entire value chain of your product than, you know, one type of statement of work or one type managed services or professional services statements of work. Like let's embed and really kind of cover the whole value chain there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we've got 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes for questions. Um, so shall I, we've got a few that have come in. Shall I uh, read them out? So <laughs> what, what, what can you do when you say all of these things and they fall on deaf ears? Uh, you run away. <laughs> I actually experienced this, um, you know, back many years ago when um, as an engineer and working with the DevOps, with the dev people, we wanted to create our own DevOps type work. And, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of buy-in. And so what we did was we made um, a POC, basically. Yeah. And we used a small, a small area and, just proved it. And yes, it worked beautifully. Well, we had issues, but it worked beautifully. And um, I think that really sold it for the rest of the groups. Hmm. Yeah, I think it depends on which ears that are deaf. Um, because yeah. depending on who are, who's not listening to you, uh, you might want to take different stances. Tam is, is absolutely right. I mean, start small, POCing it, trying it out. Um, it doesn't have to be this massive transformation across the company. It really starts small and it starts from within. And I think this is one case where I do hold tool chains as in high regard. I think tool chains uh, have a way of, of shifting things around. Like so introducing new tool sets into your pipeline or to your development team is gonna start to advocating 
some changed behaviors and patterns as well. And it kind of like grows from that, right? If indeed you have deaf ears from your managers, etc., then I would argue you should try and connect with whoever has a business incentive of your company functioning better, and and go that adopt the 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 uh, DevOps practice of metrics, right? Measurement. Try to figure out what KPIs that they are running by. What makes what do they value? what makes them successful and see how that plugs in with what you're trying to achieve in your change, right? Because there's no thing is sake for, you don't want to change for the sake of changing, right? You, you want to change because you want to improve and improve what area do you want to improve and how does that align with someone else's business interest? Because if you can get the business with you, if you're an IT person, uh, then you'd be surprised how quickly all these hurdles blow away. Um, yeah, but if you're fighting an uphill battle, then... It it, it takes time. It, no, but it takes time. It right? does. It, it, at the end of the day, as an individual, you have to say, well, you know, can, can I wait? Can I, can, I, can, I, can I live this out? But most organizations will come to that answer. It's just some come sooner rather than later. And I think, you know, there are things that you as an individual can do. Um, I mean, that might just be sh sharing, reading, um, you know, getting people to read the Phoenix Project. It could be um, I'm, 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 I'm playing around with new tech or, uh, you know, shall we start doing things a little bit differently, the way in which we organize ourselves? Um, you know, are there stakeholders that you can bring in outside of IT just, just to get, get people participating in the story that you're building within your organization? But fundamentally, you know, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of the, you know, just like with Agile, for example, if you want, you know, businesses that want to be Agile, yeah, that, that's a big change for a business, right? That's a that's a real fundamental shift in in the structure of a business, the processes, and and a complete cultural change. So, you know, those, those things take time; they don't happen overnight. You know, and we've been yeah. working with organisations that have been doing that for for years now, and just because they're very large organisations and it takes time, you know. Right. I'm, sure, I'm sure, though. I mean, I know Tammy works more with like lines of business. I'm sure in her what she does rather than IT, but there's probably pockets of DevOps already happening in your organization and you might not even know about it. Um, and trying to connect with those teams yes. is part of the the way in which you kind of create a catalyst for change, I think. Um, that's my opinion. I think that that's brilliant. That That's such a key point. And don't wait for the big success stories to, to fall in your lap. You, you take small, small, small successes and you market them, you advertise them. Um, the small changes are just as important as the big ones. And I think being able to put the spotlight on things that are going well is a way to start shifting those deaf ears around because everyone loves a good story. Everyone loves a good success story, right? So when you hear one of those in your team, in your organization, you want to hear more. You want to learn more and you want to see more of that. So that's one way of also shifting them around. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can do it though, right? Like I, in the late '90s and early 2000s, I was ITIL certified, and then, um, and that was I grew up my career in, you know, uh, the military and government contracting and everything else like that. And nowadays, even government contracting is moving to an agile, you know, yeah. DevOpsy, you know, different method methodology. So it's definitely doable. It might be a slow process, but um, those changes you can eventually get the buy-in for I, I think cloud helps with that um yeah it changes your mentality in the first place and so i think that helps with the buy-in and moving forward with things too yeah I, th I think adopting cloud uh if you if you do it it's gonna be it's gonna be hard not to start embracing more devops principles if you're serious about cloud um you're gonna have to struggle quite a lot not to start moving in that direction uh, because that's how cloud is sort of in its DNA uh, has both DevOps and, and agile methodologies built into it. It yeah. advocates you to do, to change the way you uh, approach things. Yeah. Um, and you can try and avoid it. Uh, it's going to be painful and hard and, and a lot of wasted hours, but it's possible, but I don't necessarily advocate it. Instead, lean in. Yeah. I've got another question. So. Uh, how is the Cloud Reach DevOps offering different from what's already available in the market? There's nothing available in the market like this. <laughs> uh, no, it's, I mean, 
uh, I'll open that up to the group if anyone's got any perspectives on this, and then I'm I'm happy to to go into the the detail on that one. Any 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 Brad, you've been close to this. How do you how do you think it's different to what's on the market? Oh, it's probably not a good time to admit I haven't done extensive market research. Um, I think you know, well, jokes aside, the the there are a lot of capabilities that cloud reach can bring in that aren't necessarily captured in some of the other offerings and i would say that you know having a strong focus on um, managed services you know 24 by 7 types of, of capabilities is not something that you always see in these types of offerings and i think it's something that you know people should be thinking about um, if you're going to invest you know time and money in um, engineering resources to try to bring features to market, then you better be thinking about how you support them. Um, and even there, you know, being able to kind of leverage, you know, Christian and his service line through this offering to um, help kind of chart out, you know, what, a, what an actual adoption program looks like and what sort of impact is this going to have, not just, you know, in this product group, but, you know, are there ways that this is going to impact the, the function at, or functionality, the functioning of your business across your whole entire organization. Um, can it, should it, how would it, you know, like what, what things do you need to be thinking about, you know, as you start to kind of align certain product teams this way? Uh, I think those sorts of things are the things that don't always get thought about when somebody says, I want a burstable resourcing model uh, that, you know, is kind of built into this. So, I mean, those are, those are kind of the two big things that I see that I don't see across some of the other types of offerings that are similar. Yeah, I think when 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 we looked into solving this problem for our customers, we we looked at a couple of the challenges that customers are having. Firstly, we've already mentioned it, right? Partners come at this problem from two different angles: professional services and then managed services. So we wanted to get rid of that as a problem, and so we've created within our organisation, we've actually restructured our organisation around being able to deliver a squad-based model, where engineering and operations are one and the same people on the same stand-ups doing the same sprint planning sessions so they are fully integrated as a team delivering like a truly unified devops solution that's kind of the first thing we wanted to solve for our customers so they just wouldn't have to worry about that the second was you know with these kind of continuous development projects in the cloud customers need want they have there's a talent gap in the market they need access to devops engineers and architects and many other you know specialist roles almost on demand and and they want to be able to draw down on that from a partner like CloudReach. So one of the things we did was create a subscription model to the service. So, you know, the best way to look at it is if there's a backlog that you might have running within your platform or your product, you can draw on these resources and scale up and scale down the squad that is assigned to you from CloudReach um, with a two weeks notice and you can scale it up based on, you know, you might have some high priority items in that backlog in the first couple of months. And then when you're finished with that, you can scale the team down. And so it aligns very nicely to the, the ebbs and flows of your budget and you can do planning, but, you know, based on that because it's a monthly fee. Um, so that was the other thing we wanted to solve. And finally, you know, we've been doing cloud for like over a decade now. We're, we're still, you know, uh, a specialist that is very agile as a business and can respond to changes really well. Um, so we can bring in specialists like from you know Tammy's part of the business, like the data part of the business. Should should your your requirements evolve from being like a platform infrastructure challenge, it could evolve into I want to look at AI ops within my platform. So within that same subscription model, we can draw in data engineers and architects into that squad and scale it up and scale down uh, as well. And so we think that. No one's really offering that in the market at the moment. A lot of people approach it from just a cloud engineering angle and like, hey, we'll give you some engineers. Yes, it may be elastic, but you know, we're really trying to solve for the entire transformation program for a customer. And I think that's where the differentiation is from our perspective. Any other comments from you guys before I move on to the next question? I'm going to give the next question to... Um, to Christian, but I think we might have already answered it within here, which was, how is DevOps different from Agile? I don't think we properly answered that. But I'll give it um, to you. We, I don't know. I, I would, I, I thought we did, but it's one of these things. You, you can spend quite a lot of time here. We, 
maybe we did beat around the bush a little bit. Um, so the, the, what I said earlier um, is that, that Agile, again, it's a set of methodologies. Uh, it could be you know Scrum or Kanban or whatever, right? It, it's, it's a way for you to incorporate change and, and uh, into your software development process, right? The ability to quickly change and quickly feed it with new functionalities and, and also like how you structure your packages, right? Um, so where am I going with this? It's essentially how you translate business requirements and business drivers into development and make that part of your, 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 your DNA. Whereas DevOps then would be from developers towards operations and IT and running anything and, and, and ensuring that you have uh, business continuity and, and operational integrity. So where, why we say that you can't really take one without the other is because the reason this, this the framework, the, the, um, the tools and the things that DevOps are trying to advocate is the things that Agile is trying to resolve. So when a company wants to become more innovative or more flexible or respond to market demands quicker, et cetera, they need to look at how do we, how do we translate these into, into feature requests? How do we translate these into software requirements, right? And mm -hmm. the developers need to see how they can quickly feed that into the application and ensure that it gets deployed into production without blowing anything up, right? And making sure that it doesn't get stopped in too many manual gates for reviewing, et cetera. So that's how Agile and, and DevOps sort of blends together and, and complements each other rather, but it's certainly not the same thing. So when we're looking to help a company become more agile, we will work a lot with the business side of that company, as well as the some of their IT teams, the, primarily the developers. Um, whereas when someone is asking us to help them become more DevOps oriented, we will then work much more isolated with with the IT teams and the different components and the networking security, et cetera, and look at what obstacles do you have today? What is the tool chain you're using? And, and how are you ensuring you're measuring the right criteria and the right metrics? So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to answer a lot of stuff in, in as fast as I can. And I realize the only thing I'm doing is making it messier maybe, but it's hopefully it gave someone a little bit of a insight. I, I feel like the short of it is agile is a, to a tool that DevOps can use. Like it's one, it's one way of, you know, implementing DevOps, but it's a, t it's a tool, right? That's, that's the really short answer, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think that's nice. We're looking at it. Um, ad, uh, yeah, it's called agile methodologies because it's, it's really, that's, it's a set of methodologies that you can implement into your teams. Um, I think when you take one step back from both of these, uh, we come back to my favorite word, culture, because you can't really define what culture is. But in e either, in both of them need you to reflect on what is unique about your culture and your company and how it functions. And it will also advocate or, or instill a, a shift in that culture. I like to think of it as DevOps is like agile beyond your software team. You know, so you're taking Agile and you're taking it out of the software team and you're taking it into the rest of the business. And that's that's kind of the way I frame it in my mind when I'm talking to customers. Um, yeah. I think we're up for time. Um, so unless you guys have any other closing comments, um, I think we'll we'll start to close it down. But uh, thank you all for, for joining. Thank you for, for all those who've, who've joined externally. And... Um, We'll hopefully see you again in the future. Um, but for now, have a great week. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you later. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks. Yeah, it was. Thanks, guys. Bye.